In part one, I talked about the origins of the Fallout series, beginning with the inventive wasteland by Electronic Arts. I explored the heart of the series in Interplay's Fallout 1 and 2, and talked a little about Fallout tactics with its inclusion of real-time combat. I finished up without comment on the amateur joke-riddled console game Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. Now I continue the journey of the franchise in Media Consumes Me's History and Review of the Fallout series, Part 2. Immediately after the release of Fallout 2, Black Isle Studios began working on another sequel to the series. Interplay at the time had just gone public on the Nasdaq Stock Exchange, and their shares began to take a nosedive after several years of reporting losses. Even though Interplay published some great games, they were purportedly spending boatloads of cash on projects like Star Trek The Secret of Vulcan Fury, a project I was eagerly awaiting having seen the preview in PC Gamer magazine. Fallout 3, along with many other upcoming projects, were cancelled. Interplay was funding its projects through credit agreements, game sales, and loans from the head of the company himself, Brian Fargo. They never kept much cash at the ready, and once troubles grew out of their hands in 1999, Titus Interactive, a French-based production company, acquired a majority interest in Interplay. In 2001, Brian Fargo, the original founder, left the company and Titus Interactive's own Herb Kane took over as CEO. A deal with Vivendi Universal was signed to publish Interplay's games, giving a much-needed lifeline to the troubled company. Black Isle Studios returned to making Fallout 3, codenaming their production Van Buren. Details began to emerge and fans salivated at the thought of another game in the franchise. The game would feature 3D graphics, using the Jefferson engine developed for Baldur's Gate 3, and continue the Fallout storyline in the American Southwest, in locations such as Arizona, Utah, Nevada, and Colorado. Even though a good percentage of Van Buren was complete, on December 8, 2003, Interplay cancelled it and closed Black Isle Studios. The troubles had escalated even with Vivendi Universal picking up publishing duties. The next year, Interplay was slapped with an eviction notice from its landlord, and shut down because of non-payment to some of their employees. Somehow, though, Interplay survived moving to a smaller office space, possibly one with a lower overhead. Years later in 2007, a leaked version of the Van Buren tech demo was released on the internet through No Mutants Allowed, a hardcore Fallout fan site. The demo contained a small incomplete tutorial level from the game, giving fans of the series a what-could-have-been look at the cancelled game. Although the game was to feature real-time combat and turn-based combat like that of Fallout Tactics, a requirement Interplay insisted on, the demo sadly only has real-time mode. Once loaded up, a character is created in the updated creation system, and the player's character starts off in an unnamed town during the Great War somewhere in the Midwest Commonwealth. Your character is escorted by a corporal of the 4th Infantry Division through the war-torn streets of the town, fighting against communist insurgents as you make your way to the vault located at the end of the level. Playing the tech demo, fans easily saw the potential Black Isle Studios Fallout 3 had. The graphics, even though most were placeholders, were spot on echoing the atmosphere of the rest of the series. The tech demo is very buggy with almost all options missing, but it is great to see for anyone who is a fan of the Fallout series. It is hard to say how well the game would have succeeded with the new engine in its final release. Going back to 2004, after cancelling Fallout 3, Interplay sold the rights to Bethesda Softworks, the makers of another successful RPG series, The Elder Scrolls. Bethesda at the time was in production of the fourth game in their Elder Scrolls series named Oblivion. Bethesda announced they would be starting production of Fallout 3 immediately, but it was speculated that production didn't fully start until Oblivion was finished. Leading up to Fallout 3's release date, fans of the series were split on whether Bethesda would give the series a faithful update. Eventually in 2008, Bethesda's Fallout 3 was released for the PC, Xbox 360, and PlayStation 3. The game featured the same engine as Oblivion, and it was easy for fans to see that it had less in common with what they were used to in a Fallout title. It was transformed into a real-time RPG first-person shooter, 
and no longer exhibited many of the traits fans were used to in the previous installments. To fans, it looked like a big-budget Oblivion Total conversion, but you could tell Bethesda tried very hard to make the story and atmosphere resemble as closely as possible to the original games. You start at the very beginning of your character's life, literally being born on the screen. From your own point of view, you emerge from your mother's womb. You are introduced to your dad, voiced by Liam Neeson, who through a series of questions lays down the basic name and appearance of your character. What follows is a small tutorial chapter inside the vault you inhabit from a small child to an adult, choosing your character's skills and traits along the way. The first few times you play this section, it is refreshing, but after a while of replay, the linearity of the vault sequence starts to show. Most of your choices are sometimes redundant, too, as after you escape, you are displayed a screen giving you a chance to undo what you previously selected. Once you have broken free into the Capital Wastelands, the choice is yours to venture wherever you choose. Although you are pointed in the direction of the main quest to find your father, the game lets you traverse to any number of locations. The game's map is gigantic, and with exception to downtown Washington, D.C., it's pretty much free of the usual obstacles to keep a player from freely traversing the area. The graphics are immense, rendering the post-apocalyptic landscape with numerous amounts of rubble and debris. You have to admit Bethesda did a perfect job in bringing the environment to life. The only real problem regarding the graphics is the color palette, which never really leaves the boundaries of its dusty grays, yellows, and greens. The dialogue is good, but not necessarily on par all the time, with some characters sounding phoned in, but nevertheless better than Oblivion. The characters in many circumstances aren't very memorable, since they all share a weird likeness in the uncanny valley. As far as the action goes, Bethesda tried to appeal to Fallout fans by incorporating the VATS targeting system. Entering into this mode targets a nearby enemy, and using your action points lets you choose which body part will be the focus of your attack. Adding in this option helps the gameplay, as much of the action in Fallout 3 is clumsy. But once you've used VATS around a few hundred times throughout the game, and your character has become godlike, watching the gory slow motion deaths gets a little tedious. In the next year, Bethesda would roll out five add-ons as downloadable content. The first up was Operation Anchorage, and at first look, seemed like an exciting concept, but once I was able to play through it, I found it was the worst of the bunch. It is more focused on action than RPG elements. The story and setting are great, taking place inside a simulation of the war in Anchorage, Alaska. The levels are somewhat linear, and much of the stealth gameplay is wasted. The only prize at the end of the frozen tundra are some weapons, armors, and items that make the rest of the game even easier than it already is. The second DLC to be released was The Pit. It featured one of the best storylines and environment of the downloadable content, forcing the player into tough decisions even though the outcomes and rewards were similar in the end. The third DLC was Broken Steel, which opened up the endgame for the player to continue the main quest, helping the Brotherhood of Steel against the remnants of the Enclave that were scattered throughout the Capital Wasteland. This DLC was a must as it changed the level cap from 20 to 30, adding as usual more weapons, armor, items, and perks. The fourth and largest of the DLCs released was Point Lookout, giving the player a whole state park in Maryland to explore. There are plenty of locations and side quests, and also hillbillies and tribals to fight. The final DLC to be released was Mothership Zeta. Finally, players got a chance to board an alien spacecraft, get their hands on advanced weaponry, like there wasn't enough already, and live the dream of fighting from deck to deck against alien hordes, something I'm sure Travis Walton wish he could have done. Now that all the DLCs have been released and featured in Fallout 3 Game of the Year Edition, it's time to look towards the future of the Fallout franchise, past all the legal troubles and intellectual property between Interplay and Bethesda. There's been a number of games proposed like Bethesda's Fallout 4, Obsidian's Fallout, New Vegas, and Interplay's Project V13. They all have me excited and worried at the same time for the franchise. Where will they take us? I hope to one day make a part 3 featuring them, but until then, I would like to thank the Fallout community over at No Mutants Allowed for their support and critical response to my articles.